connected to devil worship. That's the focus tonight of Lonnie Lardner's special report on Satanism. But we want to warn you now that some things you're gonna, you're about to see in here might be too graphic for children. So when we think about satanic music, in this day and age, we're likely to conjure two very different versions of what that might look like in our minds. The first is the more traditional stereotype of loud, heavy metal rock music that is filled with discussion of aspects of Satanism or potentially expresses a distaste for Christian orthodoxy. However, the latter can be a slippery slope in regards to defining music as Satanic. So a band like Black Funeral might come to mind with the traditional stereotype of Satanic music. <laughs> Black Funeral was founded in 1999 by Michael W. Ford, uh, known professionally as Atka Naktotter, with the aim of creating, quote, cold, haunting black metal with themes of vampirism, luciferism, satanism, and the left-hand path ritual practice. For context, uh, the left-hand path is a term that is used by various groups involved with like ceremonial or occult magic. And it essentially refers to like two opposing branches of magic. There's like some people that practice the left hand and there's some people that practice the right hand. To me, Black Funeral is a pretty straight cut example of satanic music, not just because it fits the stereotypical correct genre or sonic quality, but because the lyrical content pertains to satanic themes and the music was made with the intention of being satanic. The second version of what we might think of when discussing Satanism in music is a much newer phenomenon that is very much driven by modern social media. And it focuses mainly on musical artists that first amassed critical success and acclaim and then eventually subverted the public's expectations in some ways. There are numerous examples of modern pop and rap artists that have been accused of association with Satanism. The point in their career in which artists have drawn these claims from the public does tend to vary just based off of like that artist's niche. But the swift public response um, to the subversions, which normally claims that the artists are inspired by Satanic themes and have amassed their success and acclaim via essentially selling their souls to the devil. This response always tends to be quite similar. There's never much variation in regards to what the specific musicians are being accused of. So the Satanic Panic is kind of a larger movement that took place in the 1980s and 90s, and it encompassed much more than just the pop or rap songs that were popular at the time. They're sacrificing in their animal mutilation. They'll do it within a pentagram. They'll put black candles on each of the points of the pentagram, a grill over the top and allow the blood to drip into some kind of container because they use it for bathing in or drinking. In a condensed summary, I would say that the satanic panic can be viewed as both a religious and political movement in the United States that essentially claimed that there had been a large uptick in satanic cults and occult activities, like animal sacrifices, for example. And the claim was that through these means, Satanists were in some way becoming more powerful. In regards to the Satanic Panic's specific impact on the music industry, religious institutions, media corporations, and eventually the government, they saw the presence of Satan or the devil in music and really any other lyrical content that m might be described as subversive for that matter. They saw that as a threat to American children. I should note that this is an underlying theme throughout a majority of at least Christians discussing Satanism. A lot of it is about the future for the children. So basically, a committee was established in 1985 called the Parental Music Resources Center, and its goal was essentially to censor certain lyrical content for children. I think it's notable that the PMRC, as it's called, was established by a group 
loosely referred to as the Washington wives because they were married to very prominent American politicians in Washington. Um, This included the wife of then Senator, later Vice President Al Gore. One of the things that the PMRC did was they established a list called the Filthy 15, which basically listed 15 songs at the time that were popular that they felt included inappropriate or subversive lyrical content. This list includes a lot of notable names, including Prince, Madonna, ACDC, Cyndi Lauper. I don't know why she's on there. That's crazy to me. All in all, the PMRC was not really successful in actually censoring artists from discussing certain themes in their music. However, they were the catalyst for the requirement of the parental advisory sticker, which of course lets listeners know that there is explicit content. So I'd say the PMRC's kind of height or maybe its most notable moment was a Senate hearing where a member of the band Twisted Sister spoke in front of the Senate regarding censorship. They were saying that Under the Blade was about sadomasochism and bondage. It was about my guitar player's throat operation. It's not uh, really a, uh, a wild a leap of the imagination to jump to the conclusion that that's about something other than uh, surgery or hospitals, uh, neither of which are mentioned in the song. No, it's not a wild jump, and I think uh, I, what I said at one part was that songs allow a person to put their own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the lyrics. Uh, people can interpret it many ways. Uh, Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Someone looking for surgical references would have found it as well. The band Twisted Sister actually saw a pretty significant boost in their sales after this hearing. In my opinion, foreshadowing a future in which musicians utilize satanic themes to generate clicks and streams. I'll come back to this because that may or may not be our current day predicament. (laughs) From my perspective, the movement post-1990 kind of went from top to bottom. What I mean by that is that when it all started, it was radio TV show hosts and pastors and politicians being the ones spreading this message that essentially claimed that there was a rise of Satanism and Satanic cults. But later on, this kind of thinking evolved into a more anti-establishment agenda, eventually, at least within the public's mind, coming to inform anti-establishment theories, like the mother of all conspiracy theories, for example, the Illuminati, playing off of a very similar idea that through the use of satanic rituals, there is this elite group in society that is basically pulling the strings. And of course, with the added layer that these individuals, a part of this elite group, um, did something horrible to become a part of it and essentially sold their soul to the devil. Now, is there any validity to either side of the satanic panic? If you look into the musical side of things, was there music that was undeniably plainly satanic? Of course there was, because Satanism, for better or for worse, is a religion, and religions have always been associated with music in some way, shape, or form. Does that necessarily justify people like Al Gore holding hearings in the Senate over the lyrical content of specific music? Really, I think that comes down to your own personal beliefs. On the flip side, would I be surprised if there really is some group of elite celebrities in Hollywood that do some, you know, blood sacrifices or something. Probably not. But whether or not those claims are substantiated is really not the point of this video. I've shared all of this with you to set the stage for modern times and how Satanism and music is viewed and more or less used as a tool today. So as I previously mentioned, there are a number of American pop and rap musicians that have been accused of association with Satanism. I'd like to note that the focus on pop and rap musicians in particular is probably just a result of the fact that these genres are more likely to include more subversive themes or lyrical content as opposed to a genre like country or soul. I also think it could be argued in the American public's mind that there has been some sort of an association made between certain genres like country with Christianity and holiness versus genres like rap or pop, almost representing a more secular 
religiously subversive sound. However, of course, being that music is an art form, this is not always the case. But I do think that in the case of Satanism, this is probably, whether or not it's conscious, a belief held by a lot of Americans. Now, the actual actions that cause musicians to be at the end of rumors, such as like being involved with Satanism, can obviously vary greatly. Maybe most notably an artist like Lady Gaga and the rollout of her 2011 album Born This Way, including meat dresses and religiously subversive songs like Judas. Judas, Judas. Or even a newer artist like Doja Cat in the rollout of her 2023 album Scarlet that included shaved heads and more religiously subversive songs like Demons. There are definitely some instances of these artists' proximity to Satanism being a valid question. For example, maybe an artist like Sam Smith. When performing their song Unholy at the 2022 VMAs, they wore a red top hat with distinct devil horns, sparking controversy. Lil Nas X is another great example. He made a music video featuring himself playing the devil as well as himself giving the devil a lap dance. <laughs> but both of these examples, even without a ton of research into each of these artists, specific intentions, it's pretty clear that the inclusion of these satanic themes are meant more as a response to those who claim Smith or Lil Nas are associated with Satanism because they are members of the LGBTQ community. And these themes are really not indicative of any actual satanic lyrical content in the song. It's more of a, for lack of a better word, gimmick. Now, in a way, history seems to be repeating itself. Just like the Twisted Sisters' sales being boosted after the 1990 hearing, modern day artists have begun to employ these sort of false satanic themes within their music or visuals as a means of essentially drawing the public's attention. And really, whether or not they're substantiated, whether or not these celebrities are actually doing occult activities is irrelevant because it's working. Now, of course, that being said, it should be mentioned that there are many artists that are accused of being associated with Satanism or the Illuminati, for example, that did not ask for it. And it was not at all like an intentional decision that they made. Beyonce, in my opinion, is a great example of an artist like this. Despite her lyrical content, not only having nothing to do with Satanism, but really religion in general, it just, it's not even in the ballpark. She has been the subject of repeated rumors about being associated with the Illuminati. And it kind of just goes to show a lot of the times people are just looking for a reason to explain why this person is successful and essentially justify, I would assume, an inherent dislike that they have for that celebrity. Now, if we can establish simply for the sake of <laughs> conjecture that any perceived Illuminati or satanic or blood rituals or animal sacrifices, anything of that nature, we can establish that those aren't actually bestowing these individuals with some kind of unknown spiritual power, we'll start to come to the realization that the true power in Satanism is the fear that it generates in people, which of course in this day and age turns into chatter and comments and likes that equates to money. Of course, this only further incentivizes artists to be utilizing these satanic themes and thus the cycle continues. But hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this has been Breaking Down Satanism in Music. Go check out my other insane YouTube videos. I made a music video. And yeah, 